<laughs> All right, so welcome to the very first online lecture in Psychology 2. This is Chapter 2 of Predictably Irrational, pages 25 to 50. This chapter, the main idea of this chapter, is an idea called arbitrary coherence. And arbitrary coherence is an extension of an idea that we learned in the last book, in Stumbling on Happiness, which was the anchoring effect. As you recall, the anchoring effect, uh, basic idea is that starting points matter. And once we're with a starting point mentally, it's difficult for us to move away from that starting point. And it's based on this basic idea that things are ambiguous. And in this case, we're talking about the arbitrary coherence of prices and the value that we put on goods. So uh, in this case, uh, we, we learn with arbitrary coherence is that the initial price of many goods is arbitrary. Uh, it comes from context. Context, and, which we learned in the first chapter, determines a lot of times how we might value something. And because it's contextual, it's very easily affected by an anchor. The second thing that arbitrary coherence has been shown to show, uh, to prove, is that once we have an anchor on a set of prices, then we tend, then that price coheres, which is why it's called coherence. So we tend to pay similar prices for items that we relate to each other in our minds, and we tend to make all our future choices based on this anchor. So the uh, major anchoring effect experiment that's described in the book is uh, people take the last two digits of their social security numbers. So every, obviously that's going to be anywhere from 0 to 99. And then you're asked, would you pay that much for a certain item? And you say yes or no. And then you're asked, well, okay, what's the maximum price that you would pay for that item? And as it turns out, when they do the experiment, people who have high last two digit social security numbers end up saying that their maximum price for an item is much higher than those who say that the price, uh, that those who have lower social security numbers. So if your social security number is 12 and you're asked, uh, would you pay $12 for a mouse, a computer mouse, you might say yes or no. And then you're asked, well, what's the most you would pay for this fancy mouse? And you might say $18 or $20. But if your social security number is 60, last two digits is 64, you're asked the same exact two questions. Instead of saying, I'll pay $25 maximum for the mouse, because you started with a social security number of 68, and that's your anchor, you end up saying something like 49. And so you end up in two very different places for the same exact item based on a completely arbitrary anchor. And then they ask, what would you pay for, let's say, a computer keyboard? And because it's a related item, they find that the prices tend to stay by the anchor. They cohere to the anchor. Um, they also find that it affects future choices. So an experiment that shows that is an experiment where uh, they had volunteers come in to get paid to listen to annoying sounds. And, one, and they anchored them in. They anchored through, uh, different groups at different... Uh, price points to listen to these annoying sounds. Um, then they said to them, hey, would you like to, you know, then they tried to get them to switch anchors, go to a different price point, and they didn't. They were sticky. They sort of stuck with the initial idea of the price point that they put on listening to 30 seconds of an annoying sound. Pause for just a second while I get a glass of water. This is different than lecturing to a class. Okay, so that's arbitrary coherence. Um, the rest of the chapter kind of takes that main idea and we look at some of the, how, how far can we take it and what are some of the implications. So uh, one implication is self-hurting. So this is sort of a subtle version of arbitrary coherence. We often will go to a restaurant because other people uh, have suggested it or we go to a movie because it's popular. Um, similarly, and that's called a herding behavior in economics or in social uh, psychology. But what happens with self-herding essentially is that uh, you make an initial choice, and it could be arbitrary, but once you've made it, if you had a good experience, you're going to make that choice again, and in essence, you become your own herd. 
you line up behind yourself because the more times that you've done it and been reinforced, the more times it is now your anchor. So you're going to end up going to Starbucks once by accident and the price of coffee is $5. Um, you used to go to Dunkin' Donuts or you never really cared where you went or you sometimes got free coffee uh, at work. But once you've gone into Starbucks and they've marketed it so that you think $5 for a cup of coffee there is reasonable, you get ambiance and you get uh, cool music and you get great service and fancy words. So the next time you're thinking, well, do I want to go back to Starbucks, you say sure. And now you've anchored your price for coffee at $5, sort of on your own with self-hurting. Um, and this, uh, again, is not entirely rational, which of course is the point of the book. Uh, it's arbitrary, and we see how it affects future choices. Um, so uh, the authors of the book wanted to sort of see how far can we push uh, this arbitrariness. So they took a, an ambiguously valued kind of experience, and they, and they wanted to say not only can we manipulate the anchor, can we manipulate the anchor of the price and the value of this thing so much so some people would be willing to pay for this experience, and other people would be willing to get paid for the experience. So basically, he read some poetry out loud, and then he said, I'm going to have a poetry reading. And to half the class, uh, they were asked, how much would you pay to hear me read poetry? And the other half of the class uh, was asked, how much would you want to get paid to hear me read poetry? And of course, just the simple act of asking those questions differently um, caused some people to actually bid a couple bucks for 10 or 15 minutes to listen to poetry, while other people demanded a couple bucks uh, for, to listen to poetry for 15 minutes. And neither group sort of broke out of the box uh, of the arbitrary getting paid or pay uh, to say, why would I pay anyone to listen to poetry, you know, to, to totally break out of it. So that they found they could take the arbitrariness of, of arbitrary coherence pretty far. So the question you should ask yourself at this point is how does this apply and, and what are the many choices that we make on a daily basis uh, that are arbitrary and that then cause us to behave a certain way over time. And uh, so because of this, uh, the next thing that, that he takes up is, well, how can we avoid falling into the mistake of this irrational mistake of starting at an arbitrary starting point and then letting that hold us down the way we look at other items or the way we behave in the future. And so the first thing uh, he recommends is look closely at your habits, whatever your habits are. Um, question them and question how much you actually value uh, the choices that you're making in your habits. Uh, the second thing is related. So how much pleasure are you getting from making that choice. So, you know, if, if we're to go back to Starbucks, if you go to Starbucks every day, first thing, question that habit. Why am I going to Starbucks every day? Second thing, how much pleasure am I getting out of it? Is the Starbucks coffee experience uh, worth five times as much as the Dunkin' Donuts experience? Or considering that work, coffee at work may be free, is it worth five dollars as opposed to free coffee? Is, so, is the pleasure derived from this uh, experience really that much more than another choice you might be able to make. And the other one is sort of, as opposed to looking at things you're already doing, is, to, is sort of a warning to be very keen uh, and trying to be objective about and paying attention to what actually you really want uh, and how much you really value things, especially when you're making a choice, any choice, that might be the beginning of a series of other choices. So that has to understand that when you do make these choices, uh, they have repercussions down the road. This stuff coheres, it keeps going, it has a tail, it has an effect. Okay? The last thing in this chapter uh, that uh, Dan Ariely looks at is, okay, what are the implications for this idea on traditional economics? And there's two places in traditional economics that this might throw a wrench into the works of the model of how traditional economics works. The first is supply and demand. 
Supply and demand are supposed to be the two factors that determine the price of an item. Uh, how much is available and how much people want it, and you draw a graph and supply is on one side and demand is on the other, and sort of where those things meet should determine the price. And that's part of economic theory. The second part of economic theory is that su supply and demand are independent variables, that supply doesn't affect demand and demand does not affect supply. Uh, so, you know, if there are 100,000 diamonds in the world, that, that affects uh, the price, but it doesn't affect the demand. It just makes the price go up. The demand will stay the same whether or not there are 100,000 diamonds or 500,000 diamonds, or the demand might move, but it won't move because the supply has changed. It'll move because the price has changed, if that makes sense. Um, but arbitrary coherence kind of throws a wrench into those works in two different ways. Uh, first of all, arbitrary coherence shows that demand actually is a result of supply and supply side ideas in various ways. Um, that is, you know, manufacturers and advertisers, which are the suppliers, can manipulate initial prices. They can manipulate what you're willing to pay for something. And it has nothing to do with the actual supply of the good, but they manipulate, they can manipulate the demand by changing the way they present the supply. Context, once again, is important. So, uh, first of all, we see supply and demand are actually not independent variables. The second thing that arbitrary coherence shows uh, is that uh, demand isn't necessarily a measure of how much pleasure or utility we get from the good because it's arbitrary. Demand can be based on our memory of what we paid in the past and our desire for coherence to continue to pay what we paid in the past, the anchoring effect. Uh, so it's not a continual re-examination of whether or not we want the good. So that's one question. So what happens to traditional economics if supply and demand doesn't work the way we think it, it works? Um, one interesting theory that R. Ailey throws out at the end, which I'm not sure I completely understand, is that um, his theory is that changes in price, uh, which should affect demand, so the price of gasoline goes from $3 to $4, people should buy less gasoline. Uh, that's traditional economics. But what he says is that you've gotten used to your anchoring effect, your arbitrary coherence, has gotten you used to buying gasoline at $3. But it's also gotten you used to buying a certain amount of gasoline. And that you can adjust, even though it's difficult, after time, you adjust to a new anchor and you say, okay, $4 for gasoline is the new normal, the new anchor, and you go back to your previous levels of consumption. Your demand has actually not changed. So his theory is that when you change the price, you will have short-term effects. People will be like, oh, I don't know how much if I can pay that much. Then people get used to the new anchor, and they go back to uh, their old levels of consumption. That's his theory anyways. I'm not sure if I actually agree or even understand that one. Uh, the second traditional economic theory that this seems to give us trouble is the idea of the free market and the idea of free, free trade. The idea of the free market and free trade says that if two people have something to both buy and sell in the market, uh, the seller knows exactly how much it's worth and how, and how much it's worth it to sell it, and the buyer knows exactly what value they will get from buying it and then puts a dollar value on it. And then because of this, both parties benefit from the trade. You got what you wanted in price, and I got what I wanted in value and pleasure and utility. Well. The problem is, uh, this seems to show us that value and utility are not so well figured by players in the market. They don't actually make a rational judgment about the value of the thing they are about to buy. So in this case, uh, you might have a, a trade where both parties do not benefit. And that sort of goes against this idea that in the free market, both parties benefit from the trade. But if the price is arbitrary, and the price is coherent to something that was arbitrary to begin with, it may be <coughs> that you're not actually getting the value of the good um, as, a, as a buyer. 
um, that you could be. You're not maximizing your utility. Uh, so that is essentially chapter two in a nutshell. Um, main idea, arbitrary coherence. Prices, initial prices are arbitrary. They affect the way we think of related items and they affect the way we make future choices and that's where the coherence comes in.